Woodles Woodland is truly a magical place. Hidden in a natural valley and surrounded by rolling hills of rich vegetable crops, the inhabitants of this mysterious place are as diverse and inexplicable as anywhere as you could imagine. But they all live in harmony with one common goal, to protect and preserve the enchanted forest. Life was busy and often chaotic in the central woodland. There were always jobs to be done, folks busily going from one place to the next, trading and selling, or just catching up with an old friend in one of the central woodland's many fine eating establishments. That's precisely the reason why the Diggles chose to live in the much quieter surrounding fields, where the pace of life was much more relaxed and far less stressful. Or at least, that's how it seemed. Bovey, Maurice, Grace, Esther and wee little Derek easily had the grandest home of all the Woodles families. Their habitat was huge. A vast underground maze of rooms, cubby holes and communal areas deep under the sprawling beetroot fields that encased the central woodland. The Diggles all had poor eyesight. Not completely blind like the common mole, but their eyes were best of all in the dark. There were very few lights in their underground kingdom and they never went to the surface during sunrise hours. They were truly nocturnal, sleeping throughout the day and very active at night. Occasionally the Diggles did go into the central woodland for important occasions such as town council elections, doctor's appointments and of course the annual Christmas party. But generally they preferred to keep themselves to themselves and live a remote life out in the fields earning a living from the land. Close the door, Derek. There's a terrible draft coming through here. Who's turn is it to cook dinner today? Not me. I did it yesterday. I guess it must be me then. Poor little Derek wasn't known for his bravery and his cooking was equally poor. As the smallest of the moles, he struggled to keep up with his older brothers and sisters and he was naturally a jittery character who suffered with his nerves. When it was Derek's turn to cook, the meals were often simple, like fried beetroot steakers or banana turnover. Mmm, perhaps your best yet, little Derek. What is this? I call it beetroot surprise. So, what's the surprise? Let's stop with banana. <laughs> Life seemed remarkably happy for the family of moles, but that was far from the truth. They were living with a horrible secret that no one else in the entire Woodles realm knew anything about. The Diggles had to pay a horrifically high price for living in their huge underground province. You see, the fields above the ground were owned by a ruthless tyrant, Cedric the Evil Scarecrow. Cedric was a wicker man of absolute wickedness who ruled over the Diggles with fear and intimidation. In order to live under his fields, the family of moles had to spend each and every night picking hundreds and hundreds of beetroot to meet their daily quota. If ever they fell short of their target, even by just one beetroot, Cedric would vent his anger with almighty force. He would crush their equipment, burn their rest area, damage their home, and even threaten to physically harm them. He didn't mess with Cedric. Cedric. He was like a super bully who had earned his reputation for many acts of unkindness. Without a doubt, the most evil thing that Cedric had ever done was to eat Great Uncle Barnaby, the oldest of all the Diggles and sadly no longer with us. Barnaby had broken Cedric's number one rule and as a result, paid the ultimate price. All that the family had left was a slightly faded portrait of him hanging proudly over the fireplace. Cedric was very rich, all thanks to the endless supply of beetroot growing in the fields. The Diggles had to come to the surface at sunset each evening and pick precisely three tons of beetroot before sunrise. It was hard, back-breaking work, but their spade-like hands and superbly sharp claws meant harvesting the beetroot was relatively simple. Each morning was the same for the Diggles. At the break of dawn, everything had to be ready. The three tons of beetroot had to be on the scales and each one of the moles had to assume the position of thanksgiving. Hands over the eyes, head firmly towards the soil, as they all chanted their daily rejoice. Our supreme and glorious leader, thank you for giving us work today and letting us live on your bountiful lands. We show our love for you with this offering of crops. We beg to do this all again tomorrow, for we know it will all end in sorrow. 
There was an uncomfortable wait, a seemingly endless pause, while Cedric checked the overnight harvest. Do you think I'm stupid? Do you really think I'm going to accept this shoddy workmanship? You're worn short. The Diggles began to tremble with genuine fear. Last time they were worn short, Cedric flooded their home in a fit of rage. It was months before it finally dried out. Well, we checked and double checked the scale, sir. It was exactly three tons! Silence, you vile mammals. Remember rule number two. Cedric had five rules of obedience, and you didn't really want to break any of them. Rule number two was only speak when given permission to do so. But his number one rule was don't ever, ever look up at him when in his presence. Poor Uncle Barnaby had made that mistake some years ago and was promptly eaten for his defiance. The Diggles feared the worst as they felt Cedric eerily trundle towards them with that unmistakable sound of his giant cart. Do you seriously take me for a fool? I allow you to live under my fields, completely rent-free, in return for an honest day's work. Yet you feel the need to cheat me by going one short. I don't know who to eat first, this scrawny little thing, or perhaps the fat one on the end. Cedric was indeed a bully, and he knew exactly how to rule through fear. The Diggles were so scared that they were effectively frozen to the spot. Then, suddenly, they heard a sound that they'd never heard before. Ha ha ha! It seems you did pick today's quarter. You just didn't work to your normal tidy standards. One fell off. There was a collective sigh of relief from the quivering Diggles and an uncontrollable release from Esther. <laughs> I don't implore you lot to do the work myself. Never let this happen again. You will all may speak. No, no sir, Cedric. Sorry, Sorry Cedric, Cedric, sir. You better get underground, you foolish freaks. The sun is coming up and it's bound to hurt your eyes. Cedric scooped up the three tons of beetroot with ease and disappeared over the hill towards his huge bottling barn high on West Peak. He sounded the all-clear siren, and the Diggles wasted no time racing down the nearest molehill to the comfort of their living room. That was awful. Thought we'd had it then. We need to be more careful tomorrow. Oh, I think I need a cup of tea after that. Why are you crying, Esther? It's over now. I'm crying because he said I was fast. It had certainly been a stressful end to their day, but now, as the sun drenched the entire Woodles Valley, it was time for the weary nocturnals to catch up on some much needed sleep. After dropping off the beetroot for processing, Cedric returned to his favourite spot on Central Peak to keep a beady eye on all his prized crops. Woodles beetroot is exported all over the globe to all the big supermarkets where the humans shop for their food. Demand is high because Woodles beetroot is simply delicious and widely considered to be the best in the world. It has certain magical properties and it seems to bring great fortune and good health to all who buy it. Cedric's bottling barn can turn three tons of fresh beetroot into 10,000 jars every single day. At five o'clock each afternoon, a gigantic lorry arrives at the bottling barn, picks up the daily batch of beetroot and pays evil old Cedric in good old fashioned hard cash. The sound of that big lorry often woke the Diggles, which was handy as they had to be up and ready to start work at sunset, which usually happened around 8pm. The time before work started was the happiest part of the day for the Moles. They laughed and played and did things as a family unit. Little Derek wished it could be like that forever, but they all knew the law and what Cedric would do if they failed to comply. Night after night, the routine was the same. Harvest, present, give thanks, sleep. Harvest, present, give thanks, sleep. Harvest, present, give thanks, sleep. This routine was driven by fear, and not everyone was happy about it. After a painfully difficult but successful night shift, daybreak on one particular dull morning saw the rain lash down with such tremendous force that the ground actually shook. For the Diggles, living underground was like living in a drum. They should have all been fast asleep, but as the morning wore on, they found themselves still wide awake. This was the equivalent of them staying up really, really late. Maybe it was overtiredness that triggered it. 
But Bovey decided to speak about the unspeakable. Have you ever wondered what Cedric would do if we didn't pick any beetroot? Yeah, he'd eat us just like he ate Uncle Barnaby. Okay, perhaps. So, say he eats us. Who's going to pick his beetroot then? Um, it's a good point you make, Bovey. The rest of the Woodham's family never come out here to the outer reaches and Cedric would never get anywhere near the central Woodham because of his stupid big wheels. So what are you saying? I'm saying Cedric needs us more than we need him. Perhaps we should stop picking the beetroot and try arranging a new, fairer deal with him. One where we don't have to work so hard and perhaps get a cut of the profits. Are you absolutely mad? Insane, perhaps? He ate Uncle Barnaby just because he dared to look at him. Do you really think that Cedric is the type of fellow who cares about our feelings? He's a monster, Cedric the evil scarecrow, remember? I guess you're right, but I can't help feeling the way I do. I'm sick of living in fear, and why should he get all the profit for our hard work? Derek hadn't said a word all morning. He was just staring at Cedric through the safety of their viewing scope watching and observing his movements. Perhaps we should send little Derek to a proper father with old psycho Cedric. Eventually the rains eased and a very tired family of moles were able to get some much needed sleep. A couple of weeks had passed by and things were relatively normal. Hard work, but normal. The other moles had noticed that Derek had been very quiet and even more jumpy and nervous than ever. They were all worried about him. Little did they know, he was secretly hatching a plan. But then came Manic Monday, the day when everything changed forever. You disappoint me, Diggle. I thought it was too good to be true. Cedric wheeled up and down the line of well-trained moles with great presence. He had been planning this cruel little trick for a while now. Thought you could pull a fast one on old Cedric, did you? You've been selling me short every day. One of your vile creatures has placed a heavy stone on this game, which means my daily beet harvest has been under. Again, the moles began to quake with fear. They knew that this was serious. They were so desperate to see that heavy stone that Cedric was talking about, but they knew it was more than their life was worth just to look up. Knowing this, Cedric used it to his advantage. This very stone has weighed down the scale, which means you've been under picking each day. How dare you! This stone will cost you dearly. Cedric then played his master stroke of pure evilness. Not only was he lying about the stone on the scales, but now he pretended that one of the moles was looking up. But he wasn't going to say which one. All this to create a sense of doubt, anger and guilt amongst the family. Are you looking at me? Are you breaking the law? Please, look down for heaven's sake. Is that me? Who is that? My hands are over my eyes. I should eat you for breaking the ultimate rule. But, hmm, instead, I'll punish everyone else. Instead of three tons a day, I now demand that you harvest four tons of beef and not an ounce less. It starts tonight. Do you understand permission to speak? Yes, sir, Cedric. We do, Cedric, sir. Cedric roared back towards the barn as the all clear siren echoed through the valley. The Diggles wasted no time racing home. This is going to be impossible. Four tons! We only just have enough time to harvest three. But four tons? I don't think my back's up to it. I'm worried. Me too, and me. Anyway, who was it that looked up? I can't believe any one of us would be that stupid. As the family argued over who looked up, Derek disappeared to the reading room. He needed to be alone. He wrote a separate letter to each of his brothers and sisters because he feared he wouldn't ever see them again after tonight. He had had enough of living in fear and it was time for action. 
The mood was somber and no one was speaking as the family ate their breakfast at dusk. They needed to be ready to harvest in the fields the moment it was safe for them to go to the surface. Group hug. Derek feared this would be the last time he'd ever be able to do this. The Diggles worked at breakneck speed all throughout the night. They didn't even stop for a break. With their backs aching and their hands bleeding, Bovi's last batch just managed to tip the scales to the magic four-ton marker, just as the sun began to appear. Cedric geared into action and the dutiful moles assumed their positions. A single lone tear trickled down Derek's face as he lovingly glanced at his family. Oh, Cedric, our supreme and glorious leader, thank you for giving us work today and letting us live on your bountiful lands. We show our love for you with this offering of crops. We beg to do this all again tomorrow, for we know you're all in sorrow. Ah, you see what can be achieved when you put your mind to it, you despicable mammals. Let me check for stones on the scale. This was Derek's moment. Every fibre about his being was telling him to look at the floor and follow the rules. But an overpowering burst of courage pumped through his veins and he did the unthinkable. <laughs> Derek simply couldn't believe what his eyes were showing him. His single act of tremendous courage was about to change things forever. But he needed to convince the others. In stunned disbelief, he retook his position and his mind began to work overtime. Cool, oh, genuine four times. I'm impressed and I don't say that often. Well, you've done it once. Now let's do it all again tomorrow. Well, that wasn't too bad. At least we know we can do it. Are you kidding? My back is killing me. And look at me hands. What gives, Derek? You look like you've seen a ghost. Maybe I have. Come on, little one. Let's grab something to eat and have a good, solid day's rest. As soon as the family meal was over, Derek ran back to the reading room. He threw all the letters he had written onto the fire and scampered down the West Passage. It didn't quite go all the way to the barn, because that was strictly forbidden. But Derek had a new purpose now and was completely fearless. He used his sharp claws and all his strength to bore the passage right the way to the barn. He hatched a hole into Cedric's secret lair and climbed to the top of a huge pile of boxes to give him a bird's eye view. Just as I thought. Oh, Cedric, what does this mean for you? All I have to do now is convince the others. By breakfast time, everyone was up and active and feeling quite confident that they could pick the four tons of beetroot once again. Esther had had a soak in the bath and her back pain had eased somewhat. The others were playing a game of shufflestone when Maurice suddenly realised that Derek was missing. Where's our little guy this evening? Is he still in bed? Better go and wake him. We need every available floor tonight if we are going to hit that four ton target. No need. I'm awake. In fact, I haven't slept at all today. I'm too excited. Oh no, is it your birthday? Have we forgotten your birthday? No, it's not my birthday. Today is much more important than any birthday. What do you mean? Well, what if I said that tonight was the last ever harvest you ever had to do for evil Cedric? Would you believe me? Yeah, yeah right, right, sure, of sure, course, course we, we do. do. Well, it's true. Tonight is the last harvest. I just need you to have faith and do what I ask at weighing in time at dawn tomorrow. Have you swallowed a superhero pill or something? Are you going to war with Cedric? I love this guy. Such a dreamer. It's true. I broke rule number one this morning. I opened my eyes. What? And you're still alive? Yes. What did you see? I'm not going to tell you because you need to see it with your own eyes to believe it. I just need you to trust me. I'm not ready to be sent to drink supper. I don't want any part in this dangerous rebellion. You have to trust me. After waiting time tomorrow, we get our lives back. I've seen the future and it's Cedric free. Are you winding us up, kid? No, you say it yourself. Cedric needs us more than we need him. I was sick of living in fear. I was going to stand up and tell him that this morning, but what I saw changed everything. You just need to trust me. 
when I shall look, I need every one of you to stand up and look at Cedric the Evil Scarecrow. You're in for quite a surprise. Derek certainly sounded convincing. He was nothing like his normal nervy little self. In fact, he was brimming with confidence and full of determination and courage. Perhaps, just perhaps, he did know something, the others thought. That night, all the Diggles worked at breakneck speed once again to hit the four-ton target, spurred on by the thought that this was possibly the final time they would ever have to do it. There was an uneasy feeling of nerves and anticipation in the air as the weighing time drew ever closer. With time to spare, Derek dropped the final beetroot onto the giant scales and gathered his family together. That was hard work and we don't have to do it ever again if we don't want to. All you need right now is a lot of courage and even more faith in what I'm telling you to do. This life of fear and backbreaking work could be about to end if you'll just believe. Just at that moment, Cedric stirred, and the anxious moles assumed their normal position. Almost Cedric, our supreme and glorious leader, thank you for giving us work today and letting us live on your bountiful land. We show our love for you and the misoffering of crops. We beg to do this all again tomorrow, for we know it will all end in sorrow. I hope yesterday wasn't a good. You disgusting bunch of blurry-eyed, rat-like degenerates. Let's check the weights. This was it. Derek jumped to his feet, turned to his family and bellowed out. Look! Cedric the evil scarecrow is nothing more than a robot. He isn't <gasps> real. The reason we aren't allowed to look at him is because he's a real evil here. Our so-called great uncle Barnaby. What? Uncle Barnaby wasn't eaten by Cedric, he is Cedric. He made the story up to create a world of fear. Like fools, we fell for the myth and have slaved every day of our lives so our beloved Uncle Barnaby could become a billionaire from all his dreams. What? Behind that barn, the barn that we can't go near, according to rule number three, is a gigantic house full of luxury items and expensive furniture. All bought with the money from our hard work. Barnabas is the real billionaire beetroot bandit. I don't believe. Believe it, all right. Think about all the stupid rules we have to follow. All the fear and intimidation. He's played us, all right. You were right, little Derek. You were right. Come on. Now, let's see. Have they managed it? Hope it's not one short again. Well, once again, you vile little moles seem to have... Uh oh Mustard! Uh-oh. 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 Uncle Barnaby had well and truly been busted. Come on, family, look at this adorable face. Do I look like a dishonest mole? I was building up enough money so that one day we could live in a great big house together, enjoy amazing holidays, have the latest tech. Oh really, Uncle Barnaby? Sure you were. You're all heartbreak, Uncle. What you've done to us is unbelievably cruel. You've terrorised us. We thought you were dead. You've got to see the funny side, right? Genius, don't you think? You're a monster. A monster that needs to be taught a lesson. The moment you fear something, you give it enormous power over you. You work your fingers to the bone, all through fear. But if you have the courage to stand up to your fears, then well, you can see how the tables can turn. Barnaby knew he was in trouble. All his wit and charm wasn't going to get him out of this situation easily. It's never a wise idea to walk backwards, especially in a barn full of hazards. But Barnaby couldn't help but back off, fearing what the Woodles were about to do, when suddenly... <laughs> Quick, nail it short! What now? I've got an idea. 
Pass me those delivery stickers. I think it's high time our great uncle Barnaby took a trip. Ooh, somewhere far, far away, perhaps. Um, you're right. Ah, here we go. Non-stop airmail all the way to... India! The Diggles all watched with great excitement and a huge sense of relief as the cargo delivery driver picked up the day's containers and set off towards the airport to explore all that famous Woodles Beat route to the four corners of the globe. Let's just hope that nasty old Barnaby gets used to the heat of India when he wakes up in an entirely different continent, never to be seen in the Woodles Woodland ever, ever again. Believe it or not, the Diggles still harvest a crop of beetroot every single night of the year. But not quite perhaps as much as four tongues. They pick at a more leisurely pace and when they've had enough, they stop and make time to play and have fun. They still sell their beetroot to the big supermarkets for the humans to buy. But unlike Uncle Barnaby, the Diggles actually share the wealth with the entire Woodles community. As well as a few well-earned treats for themselves. This newfound wealth has enabled them to build a new Woodles Town Hall, an adventure park, and even a transport system to help the older residents get around the magical woodland. Life was sweet now for the Diggles. Their days of living in fear and working hard for no reward were well and truly over. The courage and bravery shown by little Derek completely changed life forever. Yet he remained a humble little guy, safe in the knowledge that he could overcome his fears no matter what. Next time you took him to some tasty beetroot, be sure to check the label on the jar, because if it's Woodles beetroot, you never know. Some of Derek's courage and the magic of that place might just rub off on you. <laughs>